All right, I am uh, doing a, a video on this book that I just started reading. It's actually two volumes. It's uh, Ian McGilchrist, and um, he's a psychiatrist in uh, the UK. And um, this is, he had his first book was called The Emissary and the Master. I think that was the title. I did not read that first book, but essentially I saw his interviews on, on YouTube and he was ar arguing that the right brain is actually more important than the left brain. And um, so this is his, his tome and it's, these are big books, um, but the, but the, the format is um, he's got these huge margins. So the, there's not, it's actually not that much, um, you know, it's not overwhelming as far as the text. I don't know, it's like, like 800 pages of book and um, two volumes. But then he has these chapter summaries. And this is the first chapter. And I mentioned this in my previous vid about how the corpus uh, colossum is mainly for inhibition. And what he's talking about in this uh, first chapter is that the the reason the corpus callosum is mainly for inhibition is because the current role of the corpus callosum is at least as much to do with inhibition, keeping the hemispheres independent as with facilitation, uh, keeping the hem hemispheres working together. So his argument is that the if you go way back into the first nervous system in in life on Earth, however ancient, I think he's talking about um, uh, sponges, maybe or something like that. Um, something, one of the ancient uh, lives in in the ocean. It's like I don't know, like seven hundred million years ago, or I don't know. 400 million at least it's way way back um before the before the cambrian explosion of the complex eyeball the eye and so um he's saying you can already track this asymmetry of the nervous system now what he's saying here is that as the brain grew larger then the physical constraints on size required inner hemispheric communication to be more selective and hence impelled inner hemispheric specialization in higher cognitive functions. So this first um, chapter here is really the core key of this whole um, argument for the two-volume to two, uh, tome of the book and it's really fascinating because um if you look at mammals the uh the echidnia echidnia i think maybe that's how it's pronounced e c h i d n a in uh australia it is a um it's like a it's like the kangaroo where it's a, a marsupial it has it has a pouch i think but it's um so it's sort of like a um sort of like an early type of mammal but they they actually have a larger prefrontal cortex than uh, humans it, as a ratio of their total brain size but the problem is is they lack um rem r e m dream sleep which is essentially our offline um consciousness compared to our waking consciousness and what what is happening if you study dreams um they're realizing that they the rem is necessary to integrate the conscious um left brain dominant uh planning with our uh subconscious um long term memory storage and uh this is a this is stored uh, genetically, and so the um, 
It's and then the, what uh, Andrea Puharich is arguing that it's actually stored in the magnetic moment of the protons as a as what he calls cytoplasma. So it's a it's not just a genetic physical memory, but it's a soul memory that's that's not physical, but it's tied to the um, the virtual photons as a as a non local information storage. And so, um, these Ian McGilchrist, obviously, as a just a standard mainstream psychiatrist, he doesn't he doesn't get into quantum biology until um, volume two. I I just sort of skipped ahead, and he starts talking about how um, there needs to be. He's looking at Rupert Sheldrake's model of um, morpho morphogenesis, which is essentially, it's been uh, dismissed by the, um, of course, by mainstream science, and even the parapsychologists have dismissed it, like Professor Stephen Broad, he, you know, he's arguing, because if you look at Sheldrake, his um, mathematics and his logic is not very solid. So it's not until you take a close look at this asymmetry that you realize that, in fact, um, Western science is claiming to be a symmetric objective logic, but in fact it's a left-brain dominant asymmetry. And as um, uh, Dr. Michael Corbalis, the professor in Australia, he's documented that the origin of human language is actually due to right hand tool dominance and you can already see this in uh, chimpanzees with the females uh, making spears for hunting so they're not dependent on the males uh, uh, raping the uh, females when they bring the, the meat home and demanding uh, sex by trading the meat and so humans originally are the female um, estrus cycle for reproduction got tied to the lunar uh, cycle, and uh, and what what St Stan Gooch was arguing, he was a uh, another uh, research psychologist in the UK, and I corresponded with him uh, through snail mail with uh, when he was living alone in a a caravan in Wales, and um, essentially. Stan Gooch is argu was arguing that th because of this brain asymmetry in evolution, um, that humans, modern humans, are all essentially uh, insane because these extreme political views of, are either a left brain extreme or a right brain extreme. And so the left brain extreme would be communism and the right brain extreme would be fascism. And the two can flip from one side to the other so that you can have fascist communists and, you know, people claiming that Nazism is socialism and uh, et cetera. When, you know, and, and, the, and this goes all the way back to Plato and this whole concept of a symmetric logic of the mathematics. And so then you have all of science based on the mathematics as a symmetric logic when in fact the empirical truth is a asymmetry and what, what Plato argued was that the sense of two-ness is due to the symmetry of the of the right and left eye and the symmetry of the right and left hand and the symmetry of the right and left foot and so he's saying that it's just a uh, it's just um self-evident a self-evident truth that are our body parts are symmetric, but in fact, the ancient knowledge realized that that it is asymmetric, and that the right and left eye are not symmetric; they're asymmetric. And this is because music is right brain dominant, and so um, the secret is is that the symmetric mathematics were only only allowed by flipping the liar around to create the lie of the irrational magnitude math that then Plato promoted as the secret truth of Tunis. 
as the irrational magnitude. So that was the Platonic form. And even Aristotle was against that because he said you can't have a negative infinity. That's a materialistic um, wavelength. And instead the negative infinity has to be a potential infinity that's not material, just as um, the uh, positive infinity would be a, in a potential infinity. And so this whole concept of potentiality of Aristotle got rediscovered in quantum physics, and that's why David Bohm called it the the quantum potential. And, um, and in non-commutative uh, mathematics is a mathematical physics. Uh, Professor Sean Majid in the UK, he says, you know, we need to realize that um, Plato's um, concept of a negative infinity as a potential infinity is what the quantum non-commutative, uh, non-local mathematics as an algebraic um, asymmetric process of time and frequency is is the real secret of that uh, negative infinity. So logically, it would mean that that the exclusion of the middle um, as the basis of logic is as a as the uh, ad absurdum um, proof for the Pythagorean theorem is not the um, true origin of mathematical logic, but rather there is a um, quantum logic of a double negative so that um, you have a negation of the negation that's um, that w he calls it the not apple. So in, when uh, Newton discovered his principle of gravity as, you know, as from the apple falling, as the mythology says, um, he's stating that, well, the, the not apple is just as valid as the apple. And um, that this is obviously our Western, the modern science is based on the concept of seeing is believing. But if you realize that listening is the origin of time and frequency as an asymmetry of time, then um, the uh, brain integration of the corpus callosum is actually more important than the inhibition. And the brain, uh, the hemispheric integration, um, what he says here, if we return back to this phrase here, the, the, um, in the inhibition, um, fi he calls it facilitation. So working together. So music is, it's proven that if you train in music from a young age on an instrument starting from before age nine, then your corpus callosum is significantly larger. And, and this is only due to music training. It's not found in any other art, art training and the reason is is because the um, music is a right brain dominant um, frequency um, process so the um, the uh, Ian McGilchrist he does not understand the secret of music because he's saying he, he uses music as a metaphor as most scientists do and he says that well if you you have to realize that music is more than just listening to the notes um as individual you know intervals it's a you have to understand it as a whole melody but um the difference between a melody and the notes is the concept of the absolute pitch of the fundamental frequency so all of science it defines the fundamental frequency uh incorrectly based on the amplitude that's from a symmetric irrational magnitude so the concept of hertz is even even incorrect because that's assuming a second in time as a geometric symmetry and so um the what what uh, stan gooch was arguing is that the neanderthal um still had this lunar um, synchronization as their dominant brain um, processing. So they're, um, they relied more on their uh, cerebellum than their cerebrum for uh, their thinking. 
and that the cerebellum is actually our deep um, unconscious and not the subconscious. And so the the cerebellum, then um, it, it changes the brain asymmetry. And this is what Stan Gucci's book, uh, Total Man, is all about, is that until you reactivate your cerebellum as the original brain and the the pe- the pineal or the pineal gland would then be the original eye and our our inner ear um when we started out as mammals the um the jawbone of the shrew is now our inner ear and so our original um vocalization in the forest was based on our inner ear as our jawbone and based on the the pineal gland being dominant as our source of perception with the uh, cerebellum and before this before this um brain specialization um gave promise to the left brain and the problem is is that the left the left side vagus nerve does not connect to the right side of the brain and so when we have left brain dominance as um this first chapter of Ian McGilchrist documents the left brain uh, lies about the truth of reality, whereas the right brain does not lie because it takes a holistic, perceptual, empirical um, processing, whereas the left brain is creating a a symbolic uh, axiom based on languages being frozen in time as a as a spatial symmetry. And so as soon as you had language being written down, it then detached from the language tied to our immediate um, perception based on right brain dominance from music. And that's why the older language is, the more musical it is. And whereas as uh, in West Asia, as a uh, written language developed, then it lost connection with that um, subconscious uh, paranormal uh, origin of music and originally the historians of culture played the lyre uh, with a, me- a long term deep memorization because the right brain frequency dominance creates a, a REM a waking REM visionary state so that you can have a, a photographic memory as holographic um, direct brain processing that then is it, this is why memorizing like Bach, when you memorize Bach on the piano, um, Zizek points out that the uh, the Western uh, tonality of Bach is spread out so that you can have the um, you can have like the dissonance of the tritone in Bach because he he didn't play it as a as a direct chord in frozen time, but he stretched it out as an algebraic process so that he could include all the um all the tuning as a pythagorean um rational uh, approximation that was secretly based on this non-commutative truth of reality and so when you memorize bach the middle slow movements then cause a, a brain a heart heart resonance due to the 1 hertz or 60 beats per minute of the timing of the um, middle movement, which is actually the, uh, as I've documented, the thinking uh, is based on the 500 milliseconds, which is a two hertz um, brainwave. So it's the equivalent of a deep dreamless sleep from thinking. And this is why we have these, you know, reptilian um, hypnosis political leaders, because they're essentially turning off people's thinking brain because they're the the only difference between thinking as a waking state and the deep dreamless sleep is the phase locking you have to have a brain integration that's phase locking through the um the corpus callosum acting as an inhi- inhibition of the right brain whereas if you train in music the corpus callosum will maintain the um, right brain facilitation as an integration. And that's why the corpus callosum gets bigger due to the music training. And you have a waking visionary state with photographic memory um, 
And so, like, my piano teacher said she was very surprised at how, how fast I memorized Bach. And then as I I tra- as I memorized Bach's Italian concerto in F major, I realized it was the middle movement that caused this um, great joy and bliss in my heart. And I, and I was laughing all the time in high school. And 